We are back another week. Thank you for indulging me my my US holiday off. I promised my wife no doors closed live streaming <laughs> to spend time with her and, and relaxing. So we are kicking off on Tuesday. We're going to talk about a region that we could not agree on what to call it in its current shape. So we can only call it as former Soviet territories. And we're going to dig into a lot of it. We're welcoming John Luca from Soviet Tours. Thanks for having me and uh, hi to everybody. All right. So let's doesn't sound like a, a uh, native uh, Russian speaking or Slavic language accent. So give, give the little intro and how you came to be so fascinated in this region. Yes, Stefan, thanks. So I have definitely not a Russian accent, but uh, an Italian one, as you can guess. Um, I was born uh, in Italy 30 years ago, well, 32 by now. And then um, I started traveling when I was in my teenage years. Uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union so were not the first countries where I traveled independently. But I al always had a very strong interest in Russia and the former Soviet Union, which led me to study Russian languages, a language both at school and at university. And then when I started traveling in the former Soviet space, uh, I hopelessly felt in love with the region and uh, also irreparably felt in love with the region. I mean, without any cure. So, <laughs> and I'm still are. And by now I've been uh, to every former Soviet Republic at least more than once. So at least twice in each former Soviet Republic, but actually uh, countless times in Russia and other major Soviet Republics, plus uh, in all autonomous republics inside the, the Russian Federation. As I was saying, I also studied the Russian uh, and Slavic studies uh, in uh, Germany, in Berlin, where I currently reside, and uh, photojournalism in London, because uh, I actually used to be a photojournalist before uh, um, founding my own company, travel company tour operator, which is uh, Soviet Tours, which is a travel company specialized in uh, tours in the former Soviet Union. All right, fantastic, and uh, that's a, a wide sweep. And, and you mentioned you you fell in love with the region, and it, it maybe can be hard to explain why a traveler falls in love with one region and maybe not. And I think people that that haven't been to the region you're speaking of might might not know more than than what they've seen on the TV news. So, talk a bit about the the variety and, and diversity. I mean, you're talking about a gigantic uh, area of the landmass of the earth just to begin with. Yes, exactly. Um, so to start with, I'm in love basically with every aspect of the former Soviet Union from architecture to culture to uh, nature to people. Uh, I mean, uh, it's hard to find something that I don't like in these areas. But to go more specifically, uh, and to talk about uh, uh, an aspect which I think uh, interests most travelers, uh, what you mentioned, uh, the diversity of this huge region. Uh, you have to remember that the former Soviet Union uh, um, covered one sixth of, the, of our planet uh, surface, dry surface, uh, excluding the oceans. And still, uh, during the Cold War, especially, a lot of people had these stereotypes that, uh, uh, I mean, it's basically just a, a giant uh, uh, snow-covered tundra with some mm -hmm. onion-shaped cathedrals, Moscow and mm -hmm. St. Petersburg, and that's it. One-sixth of the Earth's sur surface, basically just a monotone uh, <laughs> country. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, during the Cold War, and it still uh, goes on today, people uh, use uh, the word uh, Russian and Soviet uh, uh, as a synonym, I mean, synonymously, uh, as, as they were the same word. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is nothing more wrong than that, because as we all know by now, the Soviet Union was composed by so many different people, so many different republics. And that's what I really like also in the former Soviet Union, ethnic diversity, which reflects, of course, in uh, uh, traditions, religion, and uh, cuisine, uh, where, or uh, culture diversity, I mean, uh, people uh, completely different ethnicities in other thing, uh, a territory that goes from Poland, from the border with Poland to the border with Japan, from the Arctic uh, uh, circle to the border with uh, Iran, so to the Middle East. And uh, you have uh, more than 200 different nationalities in everything, the former Soviet Union, 180 only Russia. 
and I mean, and I'm speaking about indigenous nationalities, not about the recent uh, immigration. Of course, there are Chinese communities, there are even American expats living in the, mm -hmm. in the former Soviet Union, but these are rich, recent communities. But when I speak about ethnic diversity, I mean, uh, people that really live there, have lived there from a very long, long time for centuries. And uh, that's so fascinating for me and uh, something that I always try also to let my travelers, people that travel with us, understand how diverse uh, is this uh, huge region. Talk about that concept of nationalities, because I, when I lived in China, they took a very similar, when the People's Republic of China took a very similar approach to, as I understand what the Stalin era did in terms of classifying people into these ideas of nationalities and, and how China shaped it as well. So you gave a very specific number, but what, what does that concept mean uh, within these territories? Okay, so the, the history of the Soviet Union is a bit uh, um, complex in this regard. There are a lot of essays about nationality politics in the Soviet Union, but to sum it up, um, basically what happened, the, the Russian Empire, which uh, by the way was even bigger than the former Soviet Union, it was huge. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at one point it even included Alaska. But uh, the Russian Empire was this huge country with lots of different nationalities in everything it, but they were all considered B-class citizen below the Russians, the ethnic Russians. So the ethnic Russians, which made up uh, just a percentage of this huge country, were the, the, the elite, I mean, and the dominating ethnicity, and all the others were subject to that. Roughly speaking, of course, there is a lot of. After the October Revolution, Lenin decided that each of these nationalities should have uh, uh, its own autonomy, its own rights. Uh, and uh, one of the principles of uh, Lenin policy was to fight against uh, Russian nationalism and uh, um, this concept of B class and A class citizens. So he created, actually, it was Lenin's ideas to create yeah. all these autonomous areas. Mm -hmm. Stalin, actually, kind of destroyed the Lenin project in the sense that, uh, of course, he finalized the borders, so you were right in that mm. sense. But the problem is that uh, he started a process of racification of these people. Mm. Um, so local languages start to be uh, repressed, uh, local tradition uh, uh, were repressed, and the Russian language was uh, uh, again, as during the Russian Empire, uh, was compulsory to learn. And that was completely the opposite of what Lenin tried to do. Lenin tried to give uh, an, a sense of uh, um, autonomy, a sense of pride to each nationality, while all belonging to the big Soviet family. That was the Lenin's utopia. But Lenin just ruled for a very few years. And instead, Stalin ruled for more than two decades. So mm -hmm. <laughs> the result... Uh, kind of a mix of both ideas and of course uh, it wasn't the best outcome but then of course uh, Soviet history doesn't end with Stalin there are mm. Khrushchev, of Brezhnev and some so they, they started to revert to Stalinism they, they tried to revert to Stalinism but mm -hmm. it wasn't always successful but to answer your question more specifically what are these uh, ethnic uh, autonomies so some of them were first level republics, so they were the constituent republics of the former Soviet unions, which are now, so former Soviet Union, which are now independent countries. Mm -hmm. Russia is one of them, mm -hmm. Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, I mean, all the Central Asian states and the Baltic states, Latvia, mm -hmm. Estonia, Lithuania, and then Moldova, Belarus. So these were first level. And uh, within these republics that are now independent countries, there were more autonomous republics and autonomous regions that are still there to the, to, uh, as of today, but they are mostly unknown to the Western traveler. The only one that everyone knows is Chechnya. And mm -hmm. that is because there was the conflict in the 90s. And why there was the conflict? It's because Chechnya didn't... Uh, uh, didn't uh, wasn't happy with just autonomy they wanted full independence like the other 15 uh, republics that became independent states so just to sum it up and to let yeah. understand what's about i think that's a a great intro i'm gonna i'm gonna share the uh the, the screen uh the map of the republics for you to 
give us a little bit of an overview since a, a number of them are particular travel interests of mine. Okay, when I will raise my hand, I will finish uh, to talk uh, so you can jump in back. So it's basically what uh, Stefan just Stefan just shared is the map of the Russian Federation as of today. So this is not the Soviet Union, it's just the Russian Federation, which is to remember just one of the 15 uh, former Soviet republics. Uh, and this is the Russian Federation as today with the ethnic republics showed inside uh, of the territory. So inside the Russian Federation, there are 21 autonomous republics. Well, actually, right now, 22 if we consider Crimea, but we don't want to get into that. We know that Crimea is contested and we live like this. So 21 autonomous republics inside the Russian Federation that are in the Caucasus region. So basically here, down in the Russian South, Chechnya, Dagestan, Ingushetia, Karachayevo, Cherkassia, in the Volga region, Chuvasha, Bashkortostan, Tatarstan, in the North, Karelia, Komi, and in Siberia, Tuva, Buryati, Altai, Yakutia, and so on. So 21 different uh, ethnic areas. And these are big ethnic areas uh, and autonomous republics that are made uh, just for the larger, et larger ethnicities in everything, the Russian federations. But in the Russian Federation, there are more than 180 different ethnicities which don't have their own republic, but they are still not Russian ethnically wise. So it's a very, very complex and diverse country in that sense. So I think, Stefan, you can come back and uh, we can go to all right perfect it works with the jet <laughs> yeah we're t testing new tech so uh, a uh, a personal friend and friend of the group lorenzo riccardi and his name uh, signals uh, a bit about his background he's saying it is uh is it more fascinating soviet union for italians or was it more fascinating italy for people from soviet union there were That's excellent relations at that time for political reasons in italy was the best image of the west for that uh, east that's an absolutely right statement and interesting question because Italy was one of the few Western countries which cult uh, whose culture and whose citizens were allowed freely and without much restrictions inside the, the Soviet Union. Um, Italian movies, Italian songs were uh, um, displayed and aired in Soviet radio and in Soviet cinemas without much uh, censorship opposite to what happened to American movies. Because Soviet citizens were uh, in love with our country. Soviet official, high-ranking officials have very good relations with our country, not only because we had the strongest communist party in the West back then, but also because even uh, with those uh, in Italy that were not communist, they were very good relations. And I think they saw Italy, despite Italy belonged to the NATO and still belongs to the NATO, and despite Italy was uh, a major Western economy, they look at us as arm, armless, you know? We were Italian, we were smiling, joking, <laughs> um, a bit stereotypical, I know, but as an Italian, I can say that, I can be racist, I can use racist <laughs> jokes about my own ethnicity. So we were sitting at this singing pizza maker and uh, they liked us a lot and uh, they still know a lot about our culture and uh, it's very pleasant to be there as an italian to be honest yeah i'm i'm, I'm, I'm just my mind was wandering over to uh there's a mention of trieste and from russia with love the james bond movie and i've been <laughs> fascinated with just visiting trieste <laughs> but um Let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, there's there uh, a very important question. Are the barbers still uh, cutting hair in uh, Germany? Because you look, they're saying you look very trim and handsome. Oh, thanks <laughs> for that. Uh, I went Saturday actually. Ah, so they have so, they have, yeah. they have opened yeah, up. Yeah, they, they reopened. They reopened uh, last week. I mean, Germany is coping quite well with uh, COVID. I mean, it's still there, but we are going far slowly. Ah. Fantastic. Yeah, I think I, 
I would love a, a 24 hour donor kebab on my, on my street <laughs> corner. But, uh, that's, well, uh, I live in Kreuzberg, so that's the birthplace of donor kebab, apparently, according to the legend. Oh, fantastic. Do you, do you have a specific, I don't even know if you would know the name, but is there a street corner that you would recommend as your, as your go-to spot any hour of the day to, to fill there up? Is any anyone uh, um, in uh, Zonenallee. Zonenallee is a, a famous uh, street between Kreuzberg and Neukölln, uh, and uh, they're, they're really good places. I mean, I have not specifically specifically favorite one. Oh, good. And with your blessing, uh, Loviso cannot refer to Italians as singing pizza makers, so uh, <laughs> everybody's in a, you put us all in a happy mood. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, stereotypes, uh, I mean, of course, uh, they they don't uh, depict a country as it is, but they always contain a bit of truth. And it's true that Italians during the Cold War were probably the most friendly country to Western country towards Soviet the Soviet Union. And it's true that our cultural products were less uh, harmful for Soviet uh, propaganda than uh, American movies, which were displaying the opposite propaganda. I mean, Americans were doing propaganda in their own way. The Soviets mm -hmm. were doing propaganda in their own way. And we were doing just beautiful movies. <laughs> without yeah. propaganda. I mean, I, I was just thinking movies like The Bicycle Thief, these uh, exactly. this, this area way, of movies, yeah, would, yeah, would have been well. Romane, uh, mm -hmm. or Roman holidays. I mean, they were yeah. just. Yeah. And and uh, speaking of the republic, so Jordan's asking uh, which, if you have to pick one, favorite autonomous republic. So probably I will pick one in the North Caucasus, which is an extremely beautiful uh, and uh, ethnically diverse region. And my favorite one there is the Dagestan. Dagestan is a republic roughly the size of Scotland. But mm. in this republic of uh, uh, just above uh, uh, one million and a half people, officially is a bit less, but there are a lot of people that are, un are registered there. So in this republic, there are more than 30 different ethnicities and there are 14 official languages. Wow. You have to think, Stefan, mm. that the constitution of Dagestan is written in 14 languages oh, wow. <laughs> and Russian is just one of them. The others are completely different languages and they're all indigenous people. I mean, now people that have been living there for centuries. Mm -hmm. Actually, the Russians there are the newcomers. Mm. And in, in terms of the, the attractions there, certainly the cultural diversity, what is the scenery like? What is the food like? Now in Dagestan um, or in, yes, in Dagestan. In Dagestan. Yeah, yeah in Dagestan, uh, it's a mountainous republic. It belongs to the Caucasus region. So lots of beautiful mountains, high peaks, green pe mountain pastures, and um, hilltop villages, a little bit like uh, the Alps uh, 100 years ago, but with a, with a Middle Eastern flavor. So, so stone villages, mosques, uh, because the Republic majority is, uh, is Muslim. So most, uh, most people in Dagestan are Muslim. But Dagestan is also on the Caspian Sea. So you have the mountain on the west and mm. the Caspian Sea with the beaches on the east. And then, uh, yes, so then you have a couple of big cities with a lot of Soviet architecture and Soviet monuments, which uh, I also like. But mm. I think Dagestan has uh, a bit for everyone taste. So if you like nature, Dagestan has it. If you like culture and ethnicity, Dagestan got it. If you like Soviet legacy, monuments, mosaics, uh, and Soviet stuff, Dagestan got it. So there is really, really a lot of uh, different things. So definitely my favorite republic. But there are also beautiful republic in Siberia, like Altai, which is stunning landscape-wise. Yeah, and actually, well, I'll pause that on Altai for a moment. Uh, of the so we're, again, we're speaking of the Russian. So within these are all within the country of Russia. These ethnic exactly. republics. And do any of these require special? permits or logistics beyond having a valid Russian visa? Um, sorry, uh, what's the question again? Is... Do any of these republics require special permits or no. arrangements beyond a Russian visa? No. Um, these republics all belong, I mean, they're autonomous, not independent. Mm -hmm. To make a comparison for people that are 
known it know Italy a little bit. They are like South Tyrol in Italy, mm -hmm. so basically autonomous region. That means they have uh, some of the um, their own legislation legislation, but for internal matters, they have their own official language uh, on them uh, and so on. But for foreign policy, they belong to Russia. So that means a Russian visa is enough. You don't need any permit. Uh, with some exceptions, which I'm going to uh, to, to speak uh, now, mm -hmm. but there was uh, an urban myth back then, a couple of uh, uh, years ago, when I first started to travel independently myself, we speak 10 years ago, that in order to visit Chechnya, which was a, a war zone uh, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, you still needed a permit. And this mm -hmm. uh, urban myth was uh, actually Mm, kind of uh, um, fostered by Lonely Planet itself, because in Lonely mm. Planet Russia, they wrote that you needed a permit, but it's uh -huh. actually not true. Huh. I mean, uh, uh, you never needed a permit to visit Chechnya, except, of course, during the war itself and in the early 2000s. But since Chechnya reopened to tourism in the mid-2000s, you don't need any special mm. permits. The permits you need are not to enter the Republic itself, but to visit border areas with foreign countries. But that's valid not only if you visit an autonomous Republic, but wherever you are in Russia. So for example, if you're in Russia, you want to visit the area that borders with the United States, so the extreme east of Chukotka, before the Bering Strait, you need a permit. Mm. The same if you want to visit the, the strip of Dagestan, so not Dagestan in general, but just the strip of land that borders Azerbaijan, then you need a permit. So you need a permit to get close to the border, which is called border, border permit. In, uh, uh, in, uh, in Russia, Pagran Prapusk, which means uh, border permit, basically, so border permission, and uh, Pagranichny Prapusk. And basically, that's that's it. But it doesn't concern only the uh, autonomous republics in general. And uh, and Alice there is uh, mentioning some parts of Yakutia, Saka, and uh, Yamalo Nenets uh, AO require a special permit. So these are the kind of um, yeah. Uh, plus, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, so there are uh, um, the border permits plus. Uh, um, there are some areas, but that's also something that is not related to be an ethnic republic, but in general that require permits because maybe there are strategical areas, military installation, or they are close to the Arctic Circle, which is considered like a border area. So mm -hmm. the Arctic Circle, even if it's not a foreign, it's not a foreign country, it's considered a sensible area. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, there, are, there will always be areas where you need permits, but in general, in Russia, it doesn't concern if you are in an autonomous republic or not. And if you Marie want to be, Marie asking Habarovsk. No, Habarovsk, uh, you don't need a permit. Just mm -hmm. a city. It's not even in an ethnic republic, and it's on the Trans-Siberian Railway. Mm -hmm. So every tourist that go, no, that's absolutely mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every tourist just go. I, I'm just thinking, totally diverting, but this uh, talking about Russians and the the. The, the way of taking things in stride is, is an American phrase. And I'm thinking when uh, when I flew from Moscow to Sochi, we were delayed several hours because of storms. And then we flew and landed and I uh, was very tired. It was midnight at this point. I had just flown from the US connecting, connecting. And I get off uh, thinking I'm in Sochi and every passenger is acting totally normal. And so I go to try to get a a taxi it's too late for the bus to my guest house they want five hundred dollars i'm thinking oh you're cheating me my guest house is five kilometers away i get my guest house on the phone they find the niece who speaks english and they say oh actually your your plane flew to mineralni vodi because of storms and if you just wait a few hours they're going to continue to sochi <laughs> when the weather's better and i thought if i was in most countries people on the plane would be complaining screaming the pilot made announcements in Russian that I didn't understand and nobody even reacted, but you know, they were being sent to a, another city in that. So that, that calm, that calmness in the face of changes was, it was so surprising to me. I don't know. Is there, is there a way to explain that? Or? It happens a lot. Um, there is a word in Russia, which is called uh, Zmiekalka, which means uh, who think out of the box. Mm. So in Russia, you always need to have Zmiekalka. 
because uh, things are going to happen. And so mm -hmm. you have to be to react and to think out of the box. Um, but yes, that's uh, not so common in southern Russia to have the flight diverted to another uh, airport. But in Arctic Russia or uh, Siberia, it's kind of common, especially in winter for weather related reasons. Yeah, and so at that at that point, I, I at least learned that on the airports in Russia, the uh, in the arrivals, it always just says airport and <laughs> or something in the back. But if you go out of the airport to the front, they have the name of the city you're in on the front usually. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, that's my logistics tip: is if you have no idea, and now now there's GPS and all this other stuff that you know phones and that that, that, that you can <laughs> pick it up that way. But um, let, let's talk about Altai and, and also Tuva, as these are two areas that that are somewhat geographically close. You could connect on a trip, and uh, particularly fascinated me. And and uh, I'd actually been looking at uh, potentially taking a trip this year until things disrupted. So yes, um, Altai and Tuva, together with another uh, autonomous republic that borders them, which uh, very few people know, it's called Khakhasia, uh, um, which capital is uh, Abakan and uh, is inhabited by the Khakas people, which are Turkish, Turkish Mongo Mongol people. Um, they are uh, probably the three most beautiful uh, uh, regions in Siberia and republics in Siberia together maybe with Buryatia in the, uh, on the Lake Baikal, which is a bit farther east. So, but speaking only about Altai Tuva, um, they both border uh, Mongolia. Altai also uh, border um, Kazakhstan. And actually, if I'm correct, uh, now I, I have to double check. But yes, of course, China, of course. Um, and they are uh, basically the counterpart of, uh, especially Altai, is the Russian counterpart of uh, uh, the Al Mongol Altai region. Mm. And when I say Russian counterpart, uh, I'm, I, I mean that uh, in a good and uh, in a bad sense, in the sense that uh, uh, being uh, uh, Russia and not Mongolia, it's completely um, Untourist. I mean, uh, Mongolia um, in the recent years uh, has seen a, a lot of, of an increase of uh, tourism, especially mm -hmm. um, nature related or horse related tourism. But Altai does only get domestic tours. So when you are there, you're really basically one of the few foreigners visiting there. But on the other hand, uh, being Russia more a modern country than uh, Mongolia, a more uh, um, industrialized country, let's say like this, uh, um, it doesn't have, uh, especially in the cities, this uh, wild sense uh, that you get somewhere off the beaten path in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. However, in Altai, as in Russian Altai, as soon as you get out of the city, you are exactly like in Mongolia. So stunning landscape, um, mountain steps, um, super, super beautiful mountain ridges, uh, even uh, altitude desert, basically you have uh, uh, desert that are thousand meters high because uh, you are on a plateau uh, and it's just stunning. It uh, it's, was a very popular tourist destination even back in Soviet times for alpine tourism and trekking especially domestic tourism, of course, but even foreign tourists visited Altai in Soviet times. Then, of mm. course, during the 90s, it, uh, it started uh, dwindling because uh, Russia in the 90s was kind of a chaotic and dangerous country, but now it's starting uh, to, to grow again. I mean, now with Corona, of course not. And um, I've been to Altai first when I was traveling on the Trans-Siberian Railway, and I decided to make a detour because Altai doesn't lie on the, on the Trans-Siberian uh, mm -hmm. path, but south of it. And uh, it's really out of this world. I mean, it's a place uh, uh, where uh, I, 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 was I was there with my wife the first time and I was supposed to spend there like five days, but we ended up spending 10 days because it was mm -hmm. just stunning. And we really went off the beaten, off the beaten path and then we went to Tuva, which is even more wild in the sense mm -hmm. that Tuva is one of the least visited regions and areas of the Russian Federation. I should call it Republic because it's a Republic. 
And the many Russians don't even know where Tuva is. Whereas mm. most Russians know Altai because it's okay. kind of touristic, but mm -hmm. Tuva, so very few people know Tuva and uh, is uh, also one of the least Russian place in the Russian Federation because mm -hmm. there the Russians are just 20% of the population, 80% of our ethnic uh, Tuv Tuvans, which are the local ethnicity. And uh, that's, that's, that's like visiting basically another country. It's uh, just uh, super exotic for a Western traveler, but even for a Russian one. So definitely. Oh, did we get a frozen connection there? I uh, can you can you hear oh, me? Now? Okay, I we've got you back. Yep, okay. it just it just hiccuped for a moment. All right, and um, you know what? One of the struggles for certainly those of us in the U.S. is it's more common is the the limited vacation time we have. So, mm. uh, you know what what we consider a sabbatical, a European considers you know part of their vacation allowance. So. Uh, Two week trips is about the limit most of us can swing. You know, three weeks, it's usually uh, if you don't want, if, if you don't mind coming back and not having a job. So something like this part of the world, flying into Altai or Tuva, what what can That's you doable? Doable. Uh, I mean, uh, um, of course, uh, um, Siberia is huge. So mm -hmm. with just two weeks, you have to focus on one region. Mm -hmm. But in two weeks, you can do both Altai and Tuva if you just mm -hmm. stick to the main highlights. Or you just can say, OK, I want just to do everything at slow pace and just do two weeks in Altai. But theoretically, in two weeks, you can do Altai, Tuva, and even Khakhasia, and uh, uh, one or two days on the Lake Baikal on the Buryatia uh, side. I mean, uh, visiting the Buryatia Autonomous Republic, which is a Buddhist republic. Mm. Whereas uh, in the North Caucasus, where you have uh, seven different autonomous republics, Dagestan, Chechnya, Ingushetia, North Ossetia, Kabardino, Balkaria, Karachayevo, Cherkessia, and Adigea, seven different autonomous <laughs> republics, in two weeks, you can easily cover them. Of course, uh, sticking to the main highlights of each republic, but it's mm -hmm. not a crazy trip. I mean, I've done it, uh, I do, I travel to the North Caucasus basically every year, at least uh, twice myself. Okay. Um, uh, I'm actually collaborating to the first ever architectural guidebook about the North Caucasus with a German publishing house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have done longer trips, but I have also done a super uh, short trips visiting all of them uh, just in 10 days. In 10 days, you can visit all of them. Of course, it's a bit of a rush, but it's still doable. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. in Siberia, of course, uh, the distances are larger. The Caucasus is very diverse, uh, but is more, uh, how do you say in English, compact, compact, mm -hmm. compact, mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas mm -hmm. in Siberia, the distances are big. Yeah, you'll, you'll spend all day in transport. Yeah, <laughs> that's, the point. that's the point. I'm used to that. Uh, it, um, uh, speaking of transport, uh, Jorge Serp was talking about uh, 2008, drove a car from Western Europe to Moscow and back and uh, say between St. Petersburg and Moscow, there were some there were some incidents with police officers with uh, sticky fingers. Uh, is what's the situation like uh, driving around uh, different regions of Russia now? So um, I've been to Russia maybe fifteen or sixteen time by now. Uh, well, actually, probably even more if I count Moscow. And I never experienced uh, um, police corruption myself nor have my clients directly experienced. That is, however, not saying that there is not, because I've heard a lot of it, but I just never experienced myself, except only once maybe in Ingushetia. That was the only occasion. Mm. However, most of reports or travel accounts about police corruption in Russia that I read or heard, about, heard of, are before 2008, 2009. So around that year, there was a, a change uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in the police force. That doesn't mean that now they are honest people. I don't trust Russian police very much, <laughs> but personally, I never had uh, any bad experience with them. I think uh, the situation really improved. I don't have uh, um, numbers to confirm death at the moment. So I don't want to say, oh, it's perfectly fine. 
but from my own empirical uh, and personal experience, I can say it's fine now. Fantastic. That's, that's good to hear. And uh, um, an interest of, of my travels, uh, all, all different parts of the world has been World War II sites and, and to some degree World War I. And it, it seems maybe at, at first glance, there's, there's less left. If you, if you compare to say Western Europe, um, there, there's a lot of battlefields, very, very documented. I, I, I probably not done enough research, but what do you, what do you recommend as, as people with a World War II history interest of, of places to visit and focus? It, it seems like a bit like the Pacific in that there's a lot of places where things happened, but there's less to visit at the moment uh, that's that's retained or um, uh, in terms of memorials and that, but I, I may be woefully yeah. informed. So Americans, when they want to visit the World War II places related to their own country, so mm. to the American intervention in World mm. War II, they visit either the Pacific or Europe, France, and Germany. Mm. If you are interested in the Soviet side of World War II, mm. I suggest to visit the Western part of the Soviet Union, which was the part that uh, was attacked by Nazi Germany and that fought against Nazi Germany. Mm. That means outside Russia, definitely Ukraine and Belarus especially Belarus uh, has a lot of memorials uh, about uh, World War II and a lot of places that are significant historically wise. So Ukraine and Belarus outside Russia. Inside Russia, of course, uh, Southern Russia, the Volga region, Stalingrad, Volgograd nowadays, that's an obvious one, but also uh, St. Petersburg, which mm -hmm. uh, back then was called Leningrad and uh, was uh, under siege for more than one year and Moscow, of course, itself, mm -hmm. because it was also under siege. So all the western part of Russia, but also the western regions of Russia bordering Ukraine, like uh, or Belarus, like Smolensk, uh, like uh, um, Kastroma, Kaluga, all these uh, uh, western Russian cities were all attacked by Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. and until Nazi Germany was finally defeated in Stalingrad and started to retreat, all these places were battlefields. So if you like World War II history and want to get a glimpse of the Soviet side of it, everything east of Berlin, it's fine. I mean, starting from here where I live in Berlin, where there is a lot of Soviet traces, there is yeah. really a lot here, going to Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, the Baltics as well, and then Russia. Fantastic. Definitely not Central Asia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Nazi luckily didn't arrive there. I mean, there is a lot of uh, Soviet memorials in Central Asia, yeah. but they, they honor uh, the Central Asian soldiers that died on the Western mm. Front mm. for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I visited a number, say, like the Verwolf in uh, Ukraine, uh, different places in the Baltics within Russia proper. I've not. Uh, visited as much so that's well in a lot of respects i haven't visited enough of russia so that's uh, all, all on the to-do list um but let's let's talk a little bit about uh another one that has me fascinated kamchatka oh. and i've i had assumed that it was financially prohibitive on a modest budget and then i've heard other things that it's maybe not as expensive as i imagined to have a good trip so what what do you know about the region and recommend for someone that can spend some money, but but not you know thousands and thousands of dollars for uh, helicopters and such. So um, to be honest, I've never been in Kamchatka myself. It's not an, an ethnic or autonomous region, but it's one of my top list. I'm just mm. waiting uh, um, the the best moment to go. I have a very good uh, uh, partners and friends over there, and uh, you're right. I mean, Kamchatka has a big problem, and that's the cost. Mm -hmm. Kamchatka, like Chukotka also, uh, they have uh, this uh, issue with the cost basically because you cannot travel independently there. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm not, I've never been personally there, I quite know a lot about Kamchatka because I, I arranged a few tailored tours there, private trips there. So I, I know the logistics uh, and I know the itineraries there uh, and I know how the guys work there and it's... Uh, really basically you have to move around with helicopters or off-road vehicles or ships if you want to do the Avacha Bay uh, sightseeing. 
Mm. Because uh, if you go there independently, what is going to happen, and you don't want to take a tour, what is going to happen is that you will be stuck in Petropavlovsk, Kamchat Kamchatsky, the capital, mm -hmm. or travel to Esso, which is in the north, which is not the best place to visit. Mm. Um, but and I say this against my own interest as a travel as a tour operator, but uh, uh, for the sake of honesty, what you can do is to travel to Kamchatka independently and mm -hmm. then book a tour with a local agency there once mm -hmm. you are in the capital city or have the hotel arranged for you. But that's a bit more uh, spontaneous. Of course, if you want everything prepared, you have to book with a tour operator. But there is the possibility to book on sea to, to go there. But I would avoid the summers, the, uh, the um, hate season, like the summer season, because of uh, two, three reasons. So Kamchatka is very popular with Russian tourists and also mm -hmm. with American tourists. And there are very few hotels and very mm -hmm. few local operators, especially very few local operators that have helicopters. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be fully booked in some mm -hmm. And the other reason against the, uh, the, 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 the top of the summer season is uh, mosquitoes. Wow. If you go on YouTube and write... Uh, mosquitoes in Kamchatka man that's like Jumanji it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy yeah. it's uh, not, not an experience I would recommend well I'm from Minneapolis uh, Minnesota in the U.S. and I uh, we have them and we have the mosquitoes that are shared and I can say okay. yeah, it can make any place however beautiful miserable if you're exactly. I mean, yeah. eaten alive so what, what are the months then you would actually recommend I mean, a little bit before summer, like late spring, early summer, so June, or mm. late summer, like September, where mm. you have less mosquitoes and less tourists. Mm. Fantastic. And I don't mean to equate the two. It's just... Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, I, I, a lot of my travels, I say, off-beat or, or off-season are, are my favorites. To yeah, of course, better. you cannot really go in winter because it's not fun, but summer, maybe. Mm. How about the foodies? So there's a lot of travelers now that say there are foodies, which uh, and, and you can expand it uh, within Russia, within because uh, I think you might point us to the Caucasus, you know, with the f former Soviet territories or uh, or broader. Where, where, where what's the foodie itinerary look like? You're you're right again. So um, the Soviet Union is this huge and diverse region. So basically, every culture has its own food. But especially as an Italian, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that the first reason to travel in the former Soviet <laughs> Union is the food. <laughs> so that doesn't mean that there aren't good food. But it's not uh, one of the main reasons to travel. I mean, I can think of uh, 1,000 different reasons to travel to the former Soviet Union, but food uh, doesn't go on the top 10. <laughs> so, however, since it's so diverse, the food in the former Soviet Union, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of a dichotomy. So there is, a, um, it's homogeneous and diverse at the same time. So it is homogeneous, homogeneous in the sense that because they were all part of the same country, they have, there are some staples that you can find everywhere around the, the former Soviet Union. And basically, salat olivier, which is a mayonnaise salad, salad with mayo, mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. um, beef stroganoff, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, chopped veal or veal stripes with a mushroom sauce. Uh, chicken Kiev, which is a, a fried chicken uh, uh, meatball or something. I would, yeah, I don't even know how to define that. I don't like that much. Borsh, which is actually an mm -hmm. Ukrainian soup, but is uh, uh, widespread in all the former Soviet Union. Shashlik which are meat skewers that are originally from the Caucasus, but they are, you can find them all over the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So there is a, um, staples where you can say these are Soviet staples. Soviet mm -hmm. because they are common all over around the former mm -hmm. Soviet Union. There, are, there is even a good blog out there, which is called the Food Perestroika, and it's mm -hmm. about Soviet food. And uh, there is really something like that. However, then each region has its own peculiarities. And yes, you were right, the Caucasus is the best. The Caucasus has the most diverse and delicious cuisine, in my opinion, especially Georgia, of course, mm -hmm. with kachapuri, which are cheese pies, oh, yeah. and, uh, and a lot of meat stews and so on. 
But if we stick just to the Russian Federation, the republics of the North, the North Caucasus, again, Dagestan, Chechnya, Ossetia, have the best cuisine. Meat mm. pies, cheese pies, um, meat skewers, uh, um, local soups, all delicious. And uh, while we're talking about uh, the Caucasus, uh, John is asking uh, the public transport if you wanted to travel around uh, different areas of the Caucasus on public transport. Yeah, if you are uh, referring to the North Caucasus, uh, it's actually uh, very well connected. There is actually an highway going uh, all through the North Caucasus and uh, public transport is very frequent. Uh, if uh, you have already been to Russia, you know that there is uh, this mini van called the Marshrutka mm -hmm. and uh, they travel all around and basically can bring you both to the main destinations and also to the villages. Of course, uh, where the, the ones that go to the villages are less regular, less frequent, mm -hmm. but uh, public transportation is very good. And also, of course, in the South Caucasus, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, I mean, but those countries are actually very well known uh, on the tourist path by now. So I think he was referring more to the North part. Mm -hmm. And uh, surprisingly, public transportation is uh, pretty good there. And uh, he had a follow-up then on the Caucasus, top hiking spot specifically safe for solo hiking. Um, I cannot see the profile. Is a female or a male travel? Uh, it appears to be a man, John Opal. Okay. Um, so because I ask you this question because, of course, uh, I mean, we, uh, I think nobody in this group uh, would uh, say difference. We all strive for uh, uh, equality, but unfortunately that doesn't uh, yet describe the situation as it is all over in the world. So there are some dangers connected to be a female uh, in some countries. However, I wanted uh, to uh, precise that because in the North Caucasus, that's not the case, I would mm -hmm. say. I would say that as a woman, you're actually even more respected than a man in the Caucasus. Mm. Even if as a man you are respected so much, I mean, it's such a welcoming region, the North Caucasus, and they are very respectful. But as a woman, they think, I think they respect you even more. Mm. Also, if you are a woman hiking solo, they will look, you at, uh, they will look at you as uh, you are a Martian, like you mm -hmm. are coming from another planet. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, a man hiking solo is more common because these places are common also with Russian tourists. So Russian people hiking there, it's a common sight. So specifically talking about which areas are easier and safer, um, I think Ossetia, no, the Republic of North Ossetia. Uh, some areas of Dagestan are also quite safe. Dagestan is a big patchwork. So you have areas that are a bit unsafe, not really unsafe like Afghanistan or other places, but rowdy. Mm -hmm. And um, areas that are absolutely safe. And Chechnya. Chechnya which used to be one of the most dangerous parts of the world, now is uh, super peaceful, also because of the iron fist of its uh, ruler, Ramzan Kadyrov. Mm -hmm. But uh, one, a good side of this is that it's very safe. There are many bad sides of uh, this autocracy, but one good side, the positive side, is that Chechnya is uh, very, very safe. Mm. Fantastic. And then we, we've had some commentary about my second choice of the food. So in the uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, area, possibly Uzbekistan food wise as a as a, a possible rival to the Caucasus. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, I want to just to uh, um, there is a comment about Mount Elbrus, definitely oh, okay. also Mount Elbrus, all, all the Western Caucasus, Mount Elbrus, the Lagonaki Plateau in the Adigea. Um, the plateau of, of Circassian Republic, mm -hmm. so Karachayevo, Circassia, all safe and beautiful areas. Mm -hmm. So going back to food, uh, I don't really agree. So Uzbekistan, <laughs> yes, um, because of the plov, but oh. Kyrgyzstan, honestly, I love Kyrgyzstan as a country, but to be honest, the food is terrible. In my, in my personal opinion, I found Kyrgyz food really, really terrible. But I'm, that's I'm, I'm, probably, I'm probably saying Uyghur food, which is only in a certain area. That, that's what I yes. picture. And, and within China, that's one of my favorite, favorite regions. That's true, that's true. But really, Kyrgyz food, like properly Kyrgyz food, no, man. <laughs> Give me my pizza. 
<laughs> well, we'll we'll agree on that. Yeah, I, I had a different. Uh, 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 as you say, the nationalities, there's so much variety. I'd say the only place in the world where I consistent, I love bread, and the only place in the world where I consistently did not like the bread is Turkmenistan. I just thought <laughs> they uh, very limited diet, and I don't know what it was, but it just seemed so dry and flavorless. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, they have this, the simple meats and all that. But, yeah, um, well, I found bread in Turkmenistan okay. I mean, the best one is in uh, um, Uzbekistan and uh, Georgia, also, which is different, of course. But Turkmenistan, yeah, I mean, it's not also it's not it's not one of the top culinary <laughs> culinary destination in the yeah, world. Probably because I crossed over from Uzbekistan, and then yeah, it's a little, a little more basic. Uh, the, it, um, uh, another way, uh, the, the digital nomad type or the uh, re visa restrictions and that could be tough. But let's say somebody has the ability to base themselves somewhere for 30 days, 60 days, not Moscow, not St. Petersburg, but say a youthful city, maybe there's university vibe, maybe there's gorgeous scenery, reasonable costs, are there you know, I, I look at the map, I have no idea, a place like Kazan or something. Are there places like that that you would say that's that's a great spot for for someone to, to check out? So I have always wondered whether I should move to Russia myself. So the question which city I, of course, asked myself and I have a few answers. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I stayed in Germany because of many reasons, but uh, there are a few cities uh, in Russia where I would like to live. If we exclude uh, St. Petersburg, which is extremely beautiful and culturally thriving, there is a lot of uh, mm -hmm. cultural venues and events, but the climate is terrible. <laughs> I will choose uh, Krasnodar in the south. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice city with a lot of uh, uh, atmosphere and uh, young uh, people and mm -hmm. a lot of startups. Uh, yeah. I mean, not really a lot uh, like Berlin. When we say a lot in Russia, it's not really a lot. But for Russia standards, uh, it's a lot of young people uh, doing um, opening stuff, uh, a lot of independent uh, uh, events and so on. So that's for Southern Russia. Uh, for uh, Siberia, I would say my favorite one is uh, very un an unusual one which is Abakan, the capital of Kakassia, because it's such a nice uh, city, but that's maybe because uh, when I visited, it was just sunny, everybody was eating outside, and it felt like a Soviet version of uh, the Italian countryside back then. So I don't know, I have uh, just a very good impression, but if I have to be more uh, rational and less uh, um, sentimental, I would say um, Novosibirsk, it's very good uh, for uh, um, startups, for digital nomads and so on, because there is a lot going on with universities. They have even a, a city, which is a satellite city of Novosibirsk, which is called Akadem Garadok, which mm. means uh, basically, it's basically like uh, uh, this, a student city uh, just outside of, of uh, Novosibirsk. And Irkutsk is also nice because it's near the Lake Baikal. And in the Far East, after Siberia, in the extreme East, Vladivostok. Vladivostok is a prime city to live because the sea is beautiful, the climate is fine, and uh, I like it a lot. Yeah, and it's it's good flight connections. I mean, it's only a couple hours from Seoul in that, so it's it's... Yeah. It's so far that it's close again in a way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you live in Seattle, for example. Uh, I mean, it's uh, not that far for the Western coast. And, uh, but I mean, if you have to give a general answer, I would say maybe Russia is not the, the first country of choice for digital nomads in general. Yeah, so, it's certainly a lot of, uh, would it be more feasible for EU passport holders than, than generally other nationalities or is there no... For, for which kind of passport holders? If you had a, like a European Union passport, you, you uh, have more relaxed visa requirements? A bit more relaxed. I mean, now they are speaking, before coronavirus, they are, were speaking about uh, visa-free for uh, uh, the country, the, not just uh, some regions in the country as it used to be, like Kalina, but they were speaking about visa-free for the whole country. But now with coronavirus, everything is still, so we don't know anything yet. Yeah. But generally, Russia is not the easiest country to live in uh, if you don't have... Uh, a job with a contract. I mean, of course, if you're hired by a company, mm -hmm. but as a digital nomad, we have to do one year visa as a business visa, which is actually a tourist visa 
mask it as a tour as a business visa it's a bit bureaucracy but it's not that hard but if they double check uh, especially about taxations and so on i mean it's uh, kind of complex in the former soviet union as a digital nomad honestly i would recommend georgia uh, Which, Georgia, I've heard of the Baltics, but I uh, also Georgia, Georgia is a prime destination for digital nomads. A lot of uh, um, friends of mine have moved to Georgia and lived there as an expat or uh, acquaintances of mine. And I was coming to that, the Baltics, especially mm -hmm. Estonia. Everybody knows about the East Estonia, so mm -hmm. the, uh, the new Estonia. So yeah, the Baltics and Georgia, definitely those. So we've got a request after this uh, talk. If you can type up some of these place names you've been listing. Uh, oh yeah, yes, I can type uh, all of them. <laughs> Hard to uh, keep all the um, traps. So James is asking about Sakhalin Island, the logistics and practicality. So Sakhalin Island, uh, I've been there uh, the first time in 2016 and uh, I was uh, actually surprised how everything that I planned for myself went according to the plan <laughs> because the uh, Sakhalin island is notorious uh, for being logistically quite difficult Sakhalin island is one of those places where you need the uh, permits for some areas on Sakhalin island so not for the island itself you can fly to Sakhalin island without permits but for uh, some parts of the island you need a propus uh, propus which means a permit propus sorry the accent keeps uh, moving <laughs> um, and uh, there is actually a railway in Sakhalin Island, which is actually very scenic and very beautiful. Um, but it's not the easiest place in Russia to move around. Uh, Sakhalin Island is a bit like Kamchatka. It's one of those places where if you want really to enjoy it, mm -hmm. you have to go with an organized tour operator. Mm -hmm. And again, against my own interest, I can mm -hmm. say you can do that independently, flying there and checking there. Or mm -hmm. you can book at home uh, with a tour operator. The, um, the first time I went there, actually, I exited the Sakhalin Island by ferry to Japan. So mm -hmm. I crossed the border between Russia and Japan, which is a sea border. And I went from Korsakov on the southern tip of Sakhalin Island to Wakanai in Japan. Mm -hmm. And the ferry I was in, I was surprised that everything went according to the plan because that ferry was notorious for being delayed for mm -hmm. days, like the Caspian Sea ferry from Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. And when uh, I was there, I was there with my wife. Um, we met a German uh, traveler who had been stuck on Sakhalin for three weeks <laughs> waiting for his ferry to depart. And uh, we were actually quite. Is tired. it inappropriate to guess that this is not a Japanese operated ferry? <laughs> <laughs> Is it, yes, it used to be a Japanese company that okay. then uh, outsourced the operation to a Russian company <laughs> because uh, it wasn't really um, profitable. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the ship itself was operated by a company from Singapore. Uh -huh. So the tickets have to be bought by a Russian company, but the company operating, was it was crazy. Oh, wow. And uh, a follow-up about the curals. No, I've never been to the Curious because you need the uh, permits to go and it's uh, really time consuming and they want to go there when uh, I have really time for those. They are also top on my list, probably together with Kamchatka. It's a good combination, but you really need permits to go even on the main island of the Kurils, which is Kunashir. And to the even to the capital city of the Kurils, uh, which is Yushno Kurilsk, uh, you need a permit. And the flights there are really, really, really irregular. So, I mean, they get canceled without notice uh, the, the mm -hmm. same day. It's uh, a nightmare. I organized once uh, a, a weekend escapade to the Kurils, and it went well, but it was like uh, uncertainty un until the last moment. Mm. And Andrea is asking, what's the most bizarre thing you've seen in former Soviet Union countries? <laughs> <laughs> I could write a book. Um, let me let me see. You know, when when uh, you have seen so many bizarre stuff, uh, uh, you, uh, you it's hard to. Uh, it's so normal, right? I think that's the exactly that's the thing. It's things that are so bizarre. The reactions are so normal to them. <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, that, that's uh, exactly the point. 
I can talk about uh, maybe the most uh, bizarre experience uh, that happened to me personally, not something that I've seen maybe on the street, because these are really too many. I have to look back at my pictures. And as I said, I'm also a photojournalist. So I used to work in the former Soviet Union also doing reportages. So much for, time uh, for the dash cam in Russia. It goes from <laughs> there. <laughs> That's of course. So I was doing the reportages there. So I've seen really a fair share of... Uh, uh, of weird stuff, but re some, and a real weird and uh, maybe unpleasant experience, well, without maybe, unpleasant experience that happened to myself. And that was actually the only bad experience in my entire life uh, in the former Soviet Union. It was, uh, it was when I was almost kidnapped mm. by three local guys in the Kalmykia Autonomous Republics, mm. a Republic, which is a Buddhist Republic uh, near Astrakhan in Western uh, uh, Russia. So it's the only Buddhist republic in Europe, because mm. geographically it's Europe. It's a fascinating place. I've been there a few times, but that was the first time I was there. It was 2010. I was still uh, very, very young, a little bit unexperienced. Uh, I had my fair share of travel before, but I was a bit naive. And I accepted an invitation by a guy in my marshrutka. And it ended up that he invited uh, two drunk guys over, friends of him. They started to be aggressive. They locked inside my room in, our, in the hotel because they actually, mm -hmm. the invitation was uh, to have a party in my room. So it was basically, <laughs> they actually invited themselves in my room and I said, yes. And then they brought in a very old uh, prostitute mm -hmm. in my room and they wanted to force me to, uh, to be with her. And of course they refused it, but that's, uh, here it comes the weird part. In order to, maybe persuade me, they were talking me about the stories how during the 90s, when the economy collapsed, they resorted to eat dogs. Mm -hmm. And we have to do things out of necessity. So even if this uh, woman was old, that was what was available. And so there were this comparison with dogs. So it was a really bizarre, weird, and terrible experience. It went well. At the end, uh, they didn't rob me. I didn't have to have this terrible experience with this uh, woman. And everything went well, but this is when people ask me, this is the most uh, bizarre thing that ever happened to me in the former Soviet Union, especially in the ethnic republics. The, the, the other part we left out was the involvement of alcohol. So yeah, in uh, Abhazia in the middle of the night, they arrived way many hours late because of a border closure. And then oh. the guy tried to mug me, but he was so drunk, he could just sort of you know, try to hug me a little bit and then I just push him off. <laughs> Was that uh, uh, near the in the in Gali near the border with Georgia? The, the uh, right when Italy? I arrived in town. So that the ah, day okay. I, the day I went there, it was it was a few months before the Olympics, and all during the day they the border was just closed. I, I mean I don't know the reason. I don't speak Russian, and so I kept coming back, and so they didn't open it till already late in the evening that I was finally able to to go across, and so it was like like eleven at night when I got into town, and it was you know, winter and that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was just kind of a hug to, to welcome me, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've been in Abkhazia, Abkhazia many times, but uh, I never had this problem myself. But I've heard that some travelers had problems in Gali, which is a city near the Georgian border. Hmm. Uh, but the rest of Abkhazia, it's quite okay. But of course, you can find people. Yeah, I think he, was so he wasn't even really sure what yeah, he was of course, to of do. Course, but, uh, yeah. Where's the, where can you find the best vodka in Russia? In Poland. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then actually I wanted, that, that leads me to a question I, I wanted to ask. So the diaspora of Russian speakers around the world. Uh, I'm familiar with Brighton Beach and in New York uh, because my father has ancestry on his mother's side comes, comes that way. Uh, oh, okay. where, where where to experience an overseas Russian community that's that's memorable, interesting. Uh, I, I wrote my master thesis on Russian diaspora. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, speaking about uh, so there are different Russian diaspora. So you have mm -hmm. the Russian diaspora in what Russians call the near abroad. The near abroad is basically the former Soviet republics and to some extent, uh, the former Eastern Bloc countries. So the Russian diaspora in Georgia, the Russian diaspora in Poland, in, Ger in East Germany, and so on. And then you have the Russian diaspora 
proper, let's say, with the Russian diaspora in America, uh, Brighton Beach, uh, in the yeah. UK, uh, and uh, in West Germany, and so on. So focusing on the Russian diaspora in the former Soviet Union, because I think that's the most uh, interesting, especially uh, for people wishing to travel to the areas. Mm, there is a big Russian diaspora in Kyrgyzstan. Mm. Um, and of course, a huge Russian diaspora uh, in Ukraine, but there are the, the difference are not really huge, like Belarus and so on. And a big Russian diaspora in uh, Latvia and Estonia. And in Estonia and Latvia, I think is the most interesting places to see Russian diaspora because Estonian and Latvians, their culture is very different to Russian. Mm. Um, or at least I would say they are proud to be different from mm. Russian. I mean, there is a lot of nationalism involved there. Yeah, we sure. don't want to get into that, but it's interesting then, for example, when you are in Estonia, if you are in, a, uh, in Pernu, on the Baltic Sea, where all the Estonians basically live, you are in a country. And if you go to Narva, near the Russian border, a city where 90% of the population is Russians, Narva, mm -hmm. you are in another country. And this within a country like Estonia, which is very small. Same can be said for Central Asia. Uh, like in Kyrgyzstan, if you go to a Kyrgyz village, you are in Asia. And if you go to a Russian village, you are in Europe, roughly. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, the, in the far abroad, uh, I really love Brighton Beach. Mm -hmm. I've been only once to the United States, I was telling you before, and that mm -hmm. was, uh, I went to Brighton Beach, of uh, course. <laughs> I, mean, explain uh, that. I mean, people maybe have heard Coney Island, which is just the next subway stop, you could say, but talk, what is Brighton Beach like? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, Brighton Beach, probably you're more an expert than me because uh, my master thesis was of the Russian diaspora in the near abroad, but uh, Rus Brighton Beach uh, is uh, the biggest uh, Russian neighborhood in the whole United States, I would guess. Um, definitely New York. So New York has many ethnic neighborhoods mm -hmm. and the Brighton Beach is one of them, but I would say it's not Russian, but it's Soviet because mm -hmm. uh, people living there are not just from Russia, but are from Ukraine, from Belarus, from Uzbekistan. And also the cuisine, the kind of food that you can find in Brighton Beach when I was there, it's Soviet food. It's exactly what I was telling you before. Uh, it's yeah. the common food that you can find all over around mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Anyway, if you happen to be in New York, go to Brighton Beach because it's a super uh, interesting place. It's um, not dangerous at all. I mean, it used to be a bit Russian mafia, especially in the 80s and the 70s. There are a lot of movies uh, uh, that play in Brighton Beach, but now it's, uh, it's really fine and uh, it's an experience. And then you can go to Coney Island, which is very American. And uh, you have Russia, the Soviet Union and the United States uh, close to each other. Coney Island, which is uh, amusement parks from the 50s, quintessentially American. Yeah. And then you have Brighton Beach, which is a slice of the Soviet Union in the United States. So we've, we've gone all the way from the Altai Republic to the F train and uh, <laughs> your your visit of, of, of harmony between the United States and Soviet Union. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us today, Gianluca, and we hope to all be Welcome. traveling again soon. Thank you to you, Stefan. Thanks for everybody, to everybody for joining in.